You all know the saying, some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. Well, today's mad lad is a textbook case of the latter, as he just couldn't stop stumbling across important people and events. Everywhere he went, he always seemed to be a part of something that would only make him even more legendary, to the point where there's almost nothing that he hasn't done. You could say that he is the main character of humanity, and he is also one of the most requested mad lads. Buckle up, boys, because this is going to be a long one. Sir Christopher Lee. on this video because it really helps me in the algorithm. But before we get into the mad lad, we have a new sponsor. This video was brought to you by Gemstone Legends. Today's sponsor is not sponsoring me solely, it's also sponsoring all of you as well. Together with Gemstone Legends, we are happy to announce the legendary contest of gemstones, taking part in which will earn you a chance to win a shiny new smartphone. For information on how to sign up, you can find all of that at the link down in the description. Gemstone Legends is an epic fantasy match 3 puzzle combat RPG where you can help heroes in building their strengths in alliances with sorcerers, knights, mages and warriors from a bunch of different factions. You can tame titans and dragons to fight against dark wizards and shadowy figures before it's too late. I personally enjoy the strategy, it is an excellent balance between challenge and reward and it has a great amount of characters and items with awesome looking designs and as usual I spend a lot of time in PvP. Gemstone Legends is currently one of the top rated apps worldwide with a 4.4 out of 5 stars on Android and a 4.8 out of 5 stars on iOS and you can find me in the game under the nickname Count Dankula. And speaking of iOS, you could be the winner of a shiny new iPhone 13 Pro, a Samsung Galaxy S21 Plus or Google and Apple cards. Just look in the description below for the details and download links to install the game or simply scan the QR code and you'll automatically take part in the contest. And this offer is only available to contestants. Moreover, after installation through my link or QR code, you will get a super bonus for new players worth $50 with the epic hero Moralia. And you can download the game and win great prizes, so show them some love, new sponsor, click the link. I've got a cold and <laughs> I really don't feel good. Click the link. Christopher Frank Carandini Lee was born on the 27th of May 1922 in Belgravia in London and he was the son of a Boer War and World War I veteran named Lieutenant Colonel Geoffrey Trollope Lee and his mother was Countess Estelle Marie Carandini di Sarzano. These are some big ass names. His mother was a member of the Italian noble house of Carandini. Christopher's lineage really sets the tone for the type of life that he would go on to lead. After all, he was a direct descendant of Charlemagne. He was only just born and he had already earned the coat of arms of the Holy Roman Empire. Also, because he was born into a noble family, he tended to have some interesting people come and visit him throughout his childhood, including Prince Yusupov and Grand Duke Dmitry Pavlovich. That's right, in his youth, Christopher Lee met Rasputin's assassins. When Lee was just four years old, his parents separated and he moved with his mother and sister to Wengen in Switzerland. He was enrolled in a preschool there called Miss Fisher's Academy and in this preschool he played the lead in a school play which was Rumpelstiltskin. So you could say that the acting career started quite early. Two years later, Lee and his family returned to England after his 
parents' divorce was finalised, and he attended Wagner's private school in Queensgate in London. The following year, Lee's mother married a banker named Harcourt George St. Croix Rose, who just so happened to be the uncle of Ian Fleming, the author of the James Bond novels. The happy couple then moved to Fulham and Lee enrolled in a boarding school in Oxford named Summerfields, where he took part in a series of school plays. The next step after Summerfields would have been the very posh and very elite School of Eton. However, Lee kind of sucked at maths, which was a handicap when he did the scholarship exam in 1935. Lee ended up missing out on a free ride by just a single place. Unfortunately, his stepdad wasn't willing to pay the school fees for Eton, so Lee ended up at the much cheaper Wellington College in Berkshire. But even though he wasn't going to Eton, he still got the upper class private school experience, which included the good old fashioned corporal punishment. In fact, Lee got beaten so often at school that he would even get beaten for the crime of being beaten too often. While at Wellington, Lee managed to excel in languages, becoming fluent in French, Spanish, Italian and German. But because being able to speak the normal languages isn't impressive enough, he was also competent in Greek, Russian and Swedish. But while he thrived as a linguist, he wasn't a big fan of all the marching and weapons training that he had to do alongside his classes. Although, little did he know, those skills would become surprisingly useful later on. Lee's language skills gave him the perfect opportunity to become a diplomat, which was more or less expected of him at the time. But he ended up leaving school in 1939 at the age of 17 because his stepdad went bankrupt and couldn't afford it anymore. Now that Lee wasn't a schoolboy anymore, he had to grow up and get a job. But... He only searched for about a month before he gave up and went on holiday. He went to stay with his older sister in the French Riviera, which was perfectly timed for Lee to see the last ever public execution in France on the 17th of June 1939. But Lee said that he turned away at the exact moment the guillotine was dropped, so he maintained his composure and never lost his head over the whole affair. Lee was actually very interested in capital punishment and he liked to visit the Crime Museum at Scotland Yard. He was also able to name every single royal executioner dating back to the 15th century. I mean, that's, that's a little bit grim, but you know, everybody needs a hobby. After leaving his sister, Lee had a very enjoyable stay in Menton with an exiled Russian princely family. You know, as you do. But, unfortunately, this was cut short as Europe was about to boogaloo by this point. So Lee went home where it was safer. Upon his return home, Lee got a job and earned a pound a week, which is... £250 in today's money. He got a job as a clerk for an American shipping company. With the working world on his doorstep, Lee embarked on the rite of passage that every young adult goes through on his journey to becoming a man. A lad's holiday. And because this is Christopher Lee, he had the perfect destination in mind. In September of 1939, Lee and the boys went to Finland to fight the commies in the Winter War. I mean, most lads just go to Magaluf, but you know, Lee wanted to kick things up a notch and keep it interesting. But there was just one little problem about their trip to Finland. None of them knew how to ski. They went to Finland to fight in the Winter War, and none of them knew how to ski. So despite being very good with a rifle, Lee and his mates were pretty much useless. And so that he didn't die, the Finnish put Lee and the other British volunteers on guard duty away from the front line, before 
sending them home a couple of weeks later, where he briefly went back to his job as a clerk. Despite having been benched, Lee was determined to serve his country and add the obligatory war story to his Mad Lad video. So, he wasted little time in joining the Royal Air Force in 1940, after his father died. Lee trained at the initial training wing at Paynton in Devon, before being stationed in southern Rhodesia. Rhodesia was still a place back then. Better times. Ready to go on his uh, first solo flying mission, but unfortunately, it was never meant to be. Before flying, Lee had suffered from blackouts and blurred vision, which was found to have been caused by optic nerve damage. So Lee was permanently grounded. And because he wasn't very useful to an air force, because he couldn't fly, they basically had him doing all of the crappy busy work. Despite being extremely disappointed, Lee didn't let this get him down, and he resolved to turn lemons into lemonade. He applied for RAF intelligence, where his initiative impressed the higher-ups. He was quickly seconded to the British South Africa Police, where he was a warder at a prison for a while, before being transferred to South Africa and then Egypt, where he continued his intelligence work throughout the North African campaign. And he also almost died when an airfield he was at was bombed. In May of 1943, the Axis surrendered in North Africa, and Lee moved to Libya for the Allied invasion of Sicily, followed by Malta and a couple of towns in Sicily itself. That winter, Lee was hospitalised in Carthage for a while after his sixth bout of malaria that year. After recovering, Lee returned to his post to find that the men were on the verge of mutiny due to frustration with lack of news about the Eastern Front or any mail from home. They were also pissed off because they were missing out on the most important of rations, something that they couldn't possibly survive without. Booze. Because priorities. Luckily, Lee managed to talk the men down and prevent a mutiny. And that July, Lee was promoted to the rank of flying officer. Despite the fact that he still couldn't fly. In the winter of 1943, Lee was seconded to the army where he served during the Battle of Monte Cassino with the 8th Indian Infantry Division and the Gurkhas. Now, <laughs> the Gurkhas... They, they deserve an entire video of their own. But let's, let's just say for now that if a soldier is told that Gurkhas are going to be coming along with them on the mission, the reaction is usually something along the lines of, well, well boys, we're about to see some fucking war crimes. <laughs> so, <laughs> saying that there would have been absolute carnage would have been putting it lightly. Lee also nearly died during the battle, but this wasn't some heroic near miss where he fought his way out of overwhelming odds. A plane had actually crashed on takeoff, and when Lee ran in to help, he tripped over a live bomb, which very fortunately did not go off. In the same year, Lee took some time off in Naples, where he went for a leisurely stroll in his own typically hardcore fashion. He climbed Mount Vesuvius three days before it erupted. Because Christopher Lee. As an intelligence officer, Lee was attached to two very notable units. The first was the Long Range Desert Group, which was a precursor to the legendary SAS. And the other was the Special Operations Executive, also known as the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. Lee was very famously tight-lipped about exactly what he got up to during the war, saying, I was attached to the SAS from time to time, but we are forbidden, former, present or future, to discuss any specific operations. Let's just say I was in special forces and leave it at that. 
people can read into it what they like. And yeah, people really read into it. This secrecy has resulted in Lee's military career becoming almost legendary, with loads of speculation and embellishment that Lee always refused to confirm or deny, which only increased his mystique even more. People believed that he was kicking arse and taking names with the best of the best, moving around behind enemy lines and sabotage and seek and destroy missions and blowing up Luftwaffe airfields or carrying out secret missions in Yugoslavia. Lee was so committed to playing coy about his military career that whenever an interviewer tried to get something out of him, Lee would have a bit of fun with them. He would lean in and ask, Can you keep a secret? And naturally, the interviewer would get excited and eager to get the first scoop on Lee's war stories. And they would say, yes, yes, I can keep a secret, Mr. Lee. And then Lee would lean in and go, so can I. The man trolled journalists. Based. Despite the fact that Lee always trolled interviewers whenever they tried to pry into his military record, they were never deterred. Even Terry Wogan couldn't resist asking if Lee was a spy. So Lee, being very tall, just stood up and said, do you consider that I would blend inconspicuously into a crowd? A spy? In April of 1945, Lee took up a position in the Central Registry of War Criminals and Security Suspects as the war ended. His job was to hunt high-ranking Nazis that had escaped Germany after the war. And of course, he was very secretive about this too, which gave him the image of an Aldo Rain-esque Nazi hunter. As Lee himself described it, we were given dossiers of what they'd done and told to find them, interrogate them as much as we could, and hand them over to the appropriate authority. We saw these concentration camps. Some had been cleaned up, some had not. Despite having sworn himself to secrecy, Lee did give a little bit of insight into what he got up to as he got older, saying that he's seen, and I quote, dreadful, dreadful things. He also described war as real horror and blood, and he admitted that horror on film doesn't affect him much as a result. Despite the swashbuckling nature of heroic war stories, Lee was pretty candid about his experience and really got across its harrowing nature in one interview where he said, I've seen many men die in front of me. So many, in fact, that I've become almost hardened to it. Having seen the worst that human beings can do to each other, the results of torture, mutilation, and seeing someone blown to pieces by a bomb, you develop a kind of shell. But you had to. You had to. Otherwise, we would never have won. Considering what we know about warfare, that's a bit of an understatement, if anything. Luckily, Lee didn't have to suffer such an environment forever, and he retired from the RAF in 1946 with the rank of Flight Lieutenant. Even though he never flew... After the war, he even carried his military ID around with him to get into police and military headquarters whenever he felt like it. Now, I would hate to bust your bubble, especially considering how much you all love epic war stories, but I have to dish out some hard truths. Lee wasn't really a member of the Special Forces. While it is True that he was attached to the Long Range Desert Group and the Special Operations Executive, he didn't actually serve with them. Being attached just means that he was an intelligence liaison, so his primary job would have been briefing and debriefing pilots and sharing intel with other units. It also doesn't help that Lee's name doesn't appear in any records, further proving that his involvement was a lot more modest than people were led to believe. As for the post-war Nazi hunting, well, in reality, Lee's job was more comprised of detective work 
behind a desk instead of scalping sauerkrauts and raiding flights to Buenos Aires. But despite the fact that I now feel like I'm telling a child that Santa isn't real, I'm not saying that Lee lied about his military service. After all, he went out of his way to avoid discussing it. But it's safe to say that the rumours of Lee's exploits got a little bit out of hand. Although this was likely by design. The special forces units that Lee was attached to weren't actually subject to the official Secrets Act, which means that Lee was free to talk about them as he pleased. He just chose not to. So any rumours that people decided to make up, they really weren't Lee's fault. Lee didn't say anything. Other people just made up a bunch of exaggerated stuff. But you can't blame him too much. What showman, especially one as larger than life as Christopher Lee, doesn't like to maintain a bit of mystique. Luckily, Lee's exploits from this point onwards more than make up for the embellishment of his military record. And it only gets crazier from here. Upon his return to civilian life, Lee just couldn't bring himself to go back to working behind the desk. So he was at a bit of a crossroads in his life and he really didn't know what to do with himself. And then one day, Lee was having lunch with his cousin, Niccolo Carandini, who just happened to be the Italian ambassador to Britain at the time, when he asked Lee, why don't you become an actor? He also pointed out that Lee's great-grandparents had founded the first opera company in the 1850s. So performing was in his blood. However, Lee's mother was less than thrilled that her son had found his calling. Lee quoted her as saying, Think of the disgrace you will bring on the family and think of the appalling people you will have to work with. What did she mean by this? Well, she wasn't wrong on that last point. But she did forget the first rule of parenting. Telling your kid not to do something only makes them want to do it more. So Lee went out and joined the rank company of youth, where he learned all about acting. And fortunately, we have footage of what Lee got up to during his training. He cleaned the stage. It was his job to clean the stage. Now, I know that that sounds bad. I mean, he went there to learn the art of acting and instead they had him tidying up after them. But, to be fair, Lee did have a very important role during their performances. He held up cue cards. You've got to start somewhere. After completing his training, when he finally got to do some real training, Lee began seeking roles in movies. However, he initially struggled due to his staggering height, which made him difficult to work with. After all, actors don't like being stuck in the shadow of another performer, figuratively and literally. Many directors didn't really know how to fit this six foot five unit into the shot, so Lee very often played his early parts while sitting down. For several years, Lee was stuck as a journeyman actor, with many small and often uncredited roles, including Laurence Olivier's Hamlet and Moulin Rouge. But while it's good to be in high-profile movies like these, you're not exactly getting the exposure you need for your career to take off when you're standing in the background as spear holder number seven. And to stack the odds against Lee even more, his parts would often either be completely uncredited or left on the cutting room floor. But this didn't deter Lee, and he would say yes to everything that was asked of him in order to get roles and make a name for himself. I mean, we've all done that, haven't we? We've all had a job interview and we've embellished our qualifications a little bit to somewhat improve our chances. But the problem was is that when Christopher Lee would do this, sometimes he would get caught out 
and find himself a little bit out of his depth. For an uncredited role in 1951's Cool Vadis, Lee was asked if he could drive a chariot, and he said, Yes, I'm licensed for all vehicles. Even if that was true, the DVLA doesn't actually give licenses or driving lessons for chariots. You know, a chariot handles a little bit differently to a Ford Fiesta. So Lee didn't manage to last very long driving what he called a dustbin with two very aggressive horses. Eventually, Lee was offered a way out of this seemingly dead-end career in 1951. While Lee was visiting Stockholm, he was just casually singing to himself the way that you do when you think no one's listening. But since fate smiles upon Lee like Athena on Diomedes, his impressively deep and resounding voice just happened to catch someone's attention. Jussi Björling, the greatest opera tenor of his time, approached Lee and said, You have the voice, what are you doing with it? When Lee told him that he was working on becoming an actor, Jussi basically said, No, screw that, acting is a waste of time, come to the opera house tomorrow at 11am and sing for me. Despite his protests and saying that he was completely untrained, Lee obliged and received an offer that he couldn't refuse. Jussi Björling, the Caruso of the North himself, gave Lee the opportunity to train under him, to refine his natural talent and become a star of the stage. But, unfortunately, Lee could not take him up on this amazing offer because he just didn't have the money to stay in Sweden for so long. As you would expect, Lee was absolutely gutted to have passed up such an opportunity. But on the bright side, Lee keeping up with acting worked out so much better for everyone in the long run. Not only because of the iconic roles that he took on, which we will get into later, but also because opera singing is very taxing on the throat. So much so that opera singers often whisper their lines in rehearsals instead of singing them properly to avoid wearing out their voices, similarly to how boxers hit each other lightly when they're training. Opera singers are so fragile that they even have to be massive divas about the humidity of their dressing rooms so that their vocal cords are kept in top shape for performing to avoid injury. So, if he became a singer, Lee would have had to inevitably retire at some point, whereas he got to keep working as an actor for the rest of his life, decades longer than the average shelf life of an opera singer. But it wasn't just singing that Lee was good at. He was also an accomplished fencer, which he demonstrated in a small role alongside the famous swashbuckler Errol Flynn in the 1955 film The Dark Avenger. Now that looks great, doesn't it? Lee looks badass and the fight seems to have been done very professionally. Well, that is because Flynn's stunt double did most of the work. When it was time to do the close-up shots, Lee had to do the sword fight again with Errol Flynn himself, who was drunk at the time. Flynn nearly cut Christopher Lee's finger off. And, as you can see, his pinky finger was permanently disfigured. But on the bright side, Lee managed to get Flynn back by cutting the wig right off of his head. A reasonable person would have just shrugged this off since he was now even for literally almost cutting off a man's finger. But no, Flynn threw a hissy fit and stormed off to his trailer. Flynn was such a bitch about the incident that it took Lee half an hour to get him to come out by convincing him that it was an accident. In fact, Lee never seemed to have much luck with filming sword fights throughout his entire career. Later in his life, he said, and I quote, I don't think I've ever done a single sword fight with an actor in which I hadn't been carved up. And I've done a great many with stuntmen and neither the stuntman or I have ever had a scratch. 
It wasn't just legends of the stage and screen that Lee crossed paths with throughout his early career. One day, Lee was meeting up with some friends in Oxford at the Randolph Hotel when they decided to go to the pub for a few pints. You know, as you do. But because Lee had an uncanny ability to be in the right place at just the right time, the pub that they picked was the Eagle and Child, which just happened to be the meeting place of the Inklings, who were a group of writers and academics from the University of Oxford that discussed fantasy literature. So imagine Lee's shock when their most famous member just casually strolled right into the pub. The author of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien himself. Lee was a very big fan, having read the books every year for the rest of his life since their release. Now, just being in the same room as one of your heroes is a big deal, but one of Lee's friends just so happened to know Tolkien and called him over to their table. Lee absolutely fanboyed during this brief encounter, recalling that he practically fell out of his chair. Naturally, everyone at the table exchanged pleasantries, but Lee was in complete disbelief at what was happening, and was about as speechless as someone in Scotland who wants to tell an offensive joke. And you know that someone is absolutely brilliant when they easily steal the thunder of someone with the gravitas and presence of Christopher Lee. But, to be fair, Lee being unable to keep his cool is understandable. Recalling the encounter, Lee said, and I quote, He was a benign-looking man, smoking a pipe, walking in, an English countryman with earth under his feet. And he was a genius, a man of incredible knowledge. Lee clearly greatly admired Tolkien, but despite Lee being pretty much frozen in awe during the only time that he ever met Tolkien, it is rumoured that he did write to him a few times. Now, this has never really been confirmed, so take it as you will, but it is said that Lee eventually got the author's blessing to play Gandalf should his masterpiece ever be given a film adaptation. In the business, we call this foreshadowing. Almost. After a decade of bit parts, deleted scenes, getting cut up while other people got all the glory, and not playing Gandalf, it was time for Christopher Lee to venture into the genre of movies that he would become known for. In 1957, Lee came to a turning point in his career where everything changed. A British studio named Hammer Film Productions hired Lee and his looming height was put to good use for the part of Frankenstein's monster in The Curse of Frankenstein. The Curse of Frankenstein was also notable for helping to boost the career of another up-and-coming actor, Peter Cushing, who was playing the eponymous mad scientist. When he and Lee met for the first time, Lee was quite salty about the fact that he didn't have any lines. After all, he was looking for his big break and how could he show off his acting abilities by just shambling around and looking intimidating. Well, Cushing had a different perspective on Lee's role and said to him, You're lucky I've read the script. You can see why the two took an instant liking to each other. Throughout the shoot, Lee and Cushing got along extremely well and would pass the time between scenes by quoting Looney Tunes at each other, because apparently even big men like Lee still like cartoons. Cushing and Lee went on to bond even further by appearing in many movies together and they quickly became very close friends for the rest of their lives. This kind of camaraderie behind the scenes must have helped the two actors a lot with coping with the relatively difficult shoot. The sets were rather small, so naturally a big guy like Lee had a tough time moving around. And Lee was also hurt during a scene where the monster is shot. That pained gasp was real, but don't worry, it was nothing major. Lee just got some of the fake blood in his eye. In the end, critics weren't huge fans of the movie. 
But it turns out that critics have always been out of touch because the audience absolutely loved it, which resulted in The Curse of Frankenstein becoming the highest grossing British film at the time. And now that they had a hit in their hands, Hammer Productions were eager to work with Christopher Lee again. If The Curse of Frankenstein got Lee's foot in the door, it was his next film that made him a star. One of his most notable ever roles. 1958's Dracula. Unlike The Curse of Frankenstein, Lee actually got to speak. Sort of. He only had 16 lines across 7 minutes of screen time. So, the movie is called Dracula, but Dracula is only in 8% of it. But, with only a few words, Lee made one hell of an impression, because his performance was instantly iconic, and usurped Bela Lugosi as the face of the famous vampire. As a result, the movie did so well that it made over $25 million worldwide on a budget of just £81,000, which made it one of the most profitable British films in history. And as for what the movie did for Lee's career, well, the size of his name and face on the billboards can speak for themselves. Much like The Curse of Frankenstein, Dracula took a lot of liberties with the source material. Bram Stoker's Dracula was described as a white-haired old man that wore black from head to foot without a single speck of colour. In the movie, however, Lee's Dracula looked nothing like this. Despite Lee's best efforts to put the essence of the literary character in his performance, he never had the script or look to pull it off. Lee's Dracula looked 30-something, suave as hell, and had a cape that was lined with red, something that would go on to become an iconic part of Dracula's image in later representations. Also, there's the issue of the infamous vampire bite. I mean, sure, it's all horrific and gory in the book, but when you're a charming as hell bad guy chowing down on a woman's neck in slow motion, it doesn't really look particularly scary. In fact, it kind of looks the opposite of scary. Yeah, Lee accidentally made Dracula hot, turning the OG Sigma male into an absolute chad. Obviously, Lee didn't intend for this to happen, but Hammer's script was just too horny for it to go any other way. A year later, Lee got to fight Peter Cushing for a third time by playing The Mummy in... The Mummy. Well, despite having no lines and being covered with bandages, Lee still managed to be scary with just his eyes and his body language. But unlike Frankenstein, Lee managed to get some lines during a pre-mummification flashback, which he actually had a lot of fun filming. The scene in question was a funeral procession scene where there was a leopard present. This was actually very common back in the day because back then movie studios could not get enough big cats in their historical epics and they were always looking for an excuse to include them in their movies. But this leopard proved to be pretty distracting. While Lee was filming the scene doing his best to look all sad and priest-like, he struggled not to laugh when he heard the handler behind him say, if I let go of this chain, it will start this lot into a gallop. As funny as footage of that would have been, the handler was a professional and the scene went on without a hitch. However, despite never being mauled by a leopard, Lee did not go through the movie shoot unscathed. Lee was left with burn marks from squibs that were used on him in a scene where Peter Cushing shoots at him. Squibs are those little exploding packets that they put on actors to make it look like they've been shot. Uh, Lee also threw out his back while carrying one of his co-stars, and he was also injured during a scene where he bursts through a wooden door.
Now, that looks safe enough. Simply push the door open and make your big dramatic entrance. How could that have possibly gone wrong? Well, someone had accidentally bolted the door shut before shooting began. So when Lee crashed into the door, he was basically running into a solid wooden wall, which dislocated his shoulder. But despite Lee's injury, they actually used this shot in the movie. And you can see the lock on the door comes swinging off as it goes down. And what is most impressive is that even though the door was bolted shut, Lee being the absolute unit that he is, still smashed right through it anyway. Luckily, apart from some bruised knees during a swamp scene because Lee couldn't see the pipes under the water that were filling the tank and he, he kept walking right into them, the rest of the production went without any further injury. With the making of the movie out of the way, it was time to promote it. And when Lee arrived outside a hotel in Manchester for an interview, he bumped into an old friend. The leopard from the funeral scene. But it wasn't a coincidence. Lee was then asked if he wanted to take the leopard into the interview with him. And Lee was just like... Yes. Lee obliged because the leopard was actually really chill for a wild animal. However, the hotel staff and the other guests... They, they, they were not so chill about it. They looked up and saw Christopher Lee just casually strolling through the hotel lobby with a fucking leopard. And so all of them got up and ran for their fucking lives. Working with Hammer Horror on these three movies boosted Lee's profile dramatically and really propelled his career forward. And when you're an actor that's starting to get a bit of clout, it's only a matter of time before journalists start sticking their noses in your business. And there is nothing that these vultures love more than prying into famous people's dating lives. So, how did Lee fare? Was he a standard Hollywood playboy type? You know, considering his height, he would certainly have a big advantage because women like tall men get your mind out of the gutter well he actually did very well as the son of a countess it was only fitting that he would attract someone pretty classy in 1958 he met Henriette von Rosen the daughter of a Swedish count named Fritz von Rosen and he met her in a nightclub in Stockholm and the two were subsequently engaged. But, as happy as the couple were, there was only one problem. In-laws. Henriette's father did not like Lee, and he made it very difficult for the two to get married, which resulted in the wedding being delayed by a year. Fritz hired private investigators to investigate Lee, and made him do interviews and even had him provide references. But when all of these, frankly, quite paranoid measures turned out in Lee's favour, Fritz wasn't satisfied. Eventually, he decided to make sure that his daughter would never marry Lee. So he gave Lee an impossible task. To obtain the blessing of the King of Sweden himself. But... Fritz had underestimated Lee's status as the anime protagonist of real life. Lee just said, okay, and then went and just, just went to the King of Sweden and got his blessing because it turns out that Lee knew him. Of, co of course he knew him. Of course he knew him. He knows fucking everyone. Her dad must have been absolutely furious at getting beaten at his own game. But, like it or not, Christopher Lee was getting that booty by royal decree. Despite having overcome all of the insane barriers to marriage, Lee ultimately called off the wedding because as a fledgling actor with barely a modest income, he thought that Henriette deserved better. But to be honest, if anyone had dodged a bullet there, it was actually Lee himself. 
Imagine having in-laws that are such assholes that they force you to treat your relationship like applying for a job. However, Lee wasn't too torn up over the breakup. In 1958, what Lee considered to be the start of his career as a serious actor began when he secured a role as the Marquis de Evremond in an adaptation of A Tale of Two Cities. It only took 43 movies for him to make it to that point, but you know, better late than never. While his career was on the up and up, Lee's personal life also took a turn for the better. Lee got a second chance at finding love in 1960. He met a Danish painter and model named Birgit Kroenke, and they got married on the 17th of March, 1961. He broke up with a countess and married a model. Absolute Chad. Two years later, the couple had a daughter named Christina Erika Carandini Lee. So things were going great for Lee. He was famous, happily married, and parts were coming to him like journalists to edgy tweets. However, he wasn't immune to being rejected in auditions. In 1962, Lee was turned down for a role in the war movie The Longest Day, which was about the D-Day landings. But it wasn't because of his ability or anything like that. It was because the filmmakers thought that he didn't look like a military man. The World War II veteran didn't look like a military man. Now, that may sound surprising, but Dwight D. Eisenhower, who was, you know, actually involved in the D-Day landings, you may have heard, actually walked out of the movie because of all of the historical inaccuracies. So, the writers and producers were obviously fucking idiots. In 1965, Lee was cast in the face of Fu Manchu. Now, that is a very Chinese name for a very Chinese character. It certainly does not sound like a role for a six foot five pasty white Englishman. So, who did Lee end up playing? Fu Manchu. Yeah, he played Fu Manchu. Um, it, it was a very different time. It was a very different time back then. And uh, that attempt at making Lee look Asian is extremely unconvincing. He's far too tall. At the time of the movie's release, the New York City mayoral election was going on. So some marketing guy had the bright idea of putting up Fu Manchu for mayor posters to generate some buzz for the movie. And it worked a little too well. Fu Manchu actually did surprisingly well in terms of write-in ballots. And I know that that's just because everyone loves a good joke candidate for a protest vote, but still, Christopher Lee accidentally became a contender for the mayorship of New York. He never really had a chance though, you know. Literal supervillains are far too honest for political office. Despite receiving little critical praise, the movie was successful financially, so Lee took part in four more Fu Manchu movies over the years. However, he later said that they should have stopped after the first one because it was the only good one. But... Unfortunately, this was not the only case of Lee having bad luck with crappy sequels. In 1965, Lee returned to Hammer Horror to star in Dracula, Prince of Darkness. Now, the first Dracula was like lightning in a bottle. It was nothing like the book character that Lee had actually wanted to play, but this was ultimately fine because the movie worked as its own thing. This, however, was not the case at all with the sequel. Lee even refused to speak because he found the lines to be unsayable. So, instead of delivering the terrible dialogue, Lee just hissed. Just, you know, hissed like a vampire. For years, Lee was increasingly frustrated by the poor quality of the writing of the Dracula movies because they were nothing like Bram Stoker's character, and he fought with Hammer for ages over it to no avail. 
From that point onwards, Lee refused to take on any other Dracula movies because the character that they gave him was not the one the author had created and the scripts were just getting worse and worse. So he never did another Dracula movie ever again. Well, not willingly. Every time Lee refused to appear in a Dracula sequel, the studio would panic because they needed their star to do the movie. So, for four more movies, they pulled the scummiest move that you can imagine. They would call Lee and tell him that he can't refuse and that he has to do the movie because Hammer had already sold it to the Americans with Lee in it. And the worst part is that they would say to Lee, think of all the people that you'll put out of work if you don't do it. And with that, Lee's hands were tied. He obviously didn't want 90 to 100 lost jobs on his conscience, especially since he really liked the crew. So he went through with it for them. But imagine writing a movie so bad that you have to blackmail your lead to be in it. How hard is it to just write a decent script? But at least Lee got to give more hickeys to hot women, so you know, silver linings. At the same time, Lee played the lead role in 1966's Rasputin the Mad Monk, which was shot using many of the same sets and cast members as Dracula 2. It's also notable for not being in any way historically accurate at all. In fact, the movie starts with a disclaimer that says, this is an entertainment, not a documentary. No attempt has been made at historical accuracy. All the characters and incidents may be regarded as fictitious. And these disclaimers are usually there to give the studio plausible deniability in case a historical figure from the movie or their relatives want to sue for defamation. But in this case, it was pretty much completely true. The movie doesn't even mention Tsar Nicholas II at all. Nevertheless, despite the script not being up to snuff, Lee reportedly compensated by giving a larger-than-life performance, which seemed to earn him a fan. Rasputin's daughter, Maria, who Christopher Lee met in 1976, because of course he did, he's Christopher Lee, he fucking knows everyone. And she said that Lee had Rasputin's expression. I don't know if that's a compliment or not. After his time as the Big Dicked Mystic, Lee was asked to lend his talents to a project concerning another famous sexual degenerate. In 1970, Lee received a phone call from a movie producer who needed a favour. One of the stars of a movie that he was working on had pulled out and his replacement also withdrew because of a bereavement. So he was pretty desperate for someone to fill the role. All Lee had to do was go to Barcelona for two days and take on the part. Sounds like a decent and easy gig. Nice trip to Spain, only two days of work, easy paycheck, job done. So Lee agreed to take on the role of the narrator in an adaptation of a story called Eugenie, the story of her journey into perversion, which was written by Marquis de Sade which was Lee's first mistake. Despite what should have been a very obvious red flag, the shoot went without a hitch. Lee showed up to the studio in Barcelona wearing a red velvet smoking jacket, shot his scenes where he basically just stood around by himself and talked, and went home a couple of days later. The only problem was that there was a reason why Lee shot his scenes alone. It was so they could edit him into the real movie. They pulled a little sneaky on him. It wasn't until six months later that Lee found out what he had unwittingly signed up for. And he found out completely by accident. 
One day, one of Lee's friends told him that he was walking down Old Compton Street in London where he saw a cinema that specialised in a certain type of movie. And he saw Christopher Lee's name on the placard outside. It was porn. It was porn. Christopher Lee accidentally featured in a softcore porno. After, after Lee had left his own shoot, the filmmakers reshot the real scenes and edited Lee into them in post to look like he was actually standing there while some certain things were, you know, go- going on next to him. Now, we've all seen Pong. I mean, I haven't. You obviously have, though. And we all know what normal porn usually looks like. But what does porn with Christopher Lee look like? Well, it is exactly what you would expect. And it is glorious. Lewd women, let the voluptuous heroine of this story be your model. Observe this ceremony of sadism, which illustrates that truth. Hearken only to these delicious promptings. For no voice save that of the passions can bring you to complete happiness. Only Christopher Lee could make dirty talk sound extremely classy. Naturally, Lee was furious when he found out that he had been involved in such smut. And because, essentially, the filmmakers had tricked him. I can't speak for the guy, but I imagine it must suck to know that they filmed all the fun parts without him. But, to be fair to the filmmakers, as soon as Christopher Lee saw the name Marquis de Sade, that should have been a huge red flag. Later in life, Christopher Lee said, I suppose you can say I've been in nearly every kind of film, one way or another. And it is truly unbelievable how so many things just happen to him by chance. It happens too fucking often to just be coincidence. I was just going down to the shop to get some milk and, long story short, Yugoslavia isn't a country anymore. Now, I know what you're all thinking. After fighting in World War II, revolutionising the horror genre and accidentally becoming the world's most famous porn star, how much more could Christopher Lee possibly do? Quite a lot, as it turns out, like, a, a lot. The man did a lot. So much, in fact, that we don't actually have time to get into all of it today. So tune in next time for part two. I'm not doing big long videos anymore when I need to sit here and film for like eight hours because it makes me want to die. So yes, there is going to be a part two that you can see next time. Of course there is a part two. It's Christopher fucking Lee. Remember to click the link down in the description and download Gemstone Legends and you could win an iPhone 13 Pro. If you don't, then when you go home tonight, I'll be under your bed. It's count thank you on YouTube! Everybody subscribe! <laughs>